and I hope you remember all of them. Okay. So with that, it's my greatest honor and privilege to introduce both Julie Thomas and Myron to you. And first, I would like to ask Julius to give us a speech first, and then after that, Myron, and then after that, we are going to have the Taiwanese translation summary and uh, follow uh, with the Q&A. Um, Julie? I'm truly overwhelmed to be here. It is a great privilege uh, to be here and to see all of you. Um, that was a wonderful slide presentation, Nick, and I can't thank you enough for all of the work you've done and for all of the other people who helped to organize this. Um, 40 years is a really long time uh, to pass after so many, what were for us, dramatic moments at that time. Um, and I think ever since we were asked back in 2003, I've sort of struggled with how to make sense of that time. Um, because there was such a disconnect. Uh, I'm, I learned to speak Taiwanese at least conversationally. I learned Mandarin Chinese a little better because as a Methodist missionary, I was expected to study that language. Now, probably the best I can say is, why die one way no way you do. I'm very sorry because Fluency is gone, the words are gone. Um, that's probably one of the hardest and saddest things for me. Um, that I do not regret anything we did, but I regret the fact that what might have been many happy years in an absolutely wonderful place uh, was denied to us. Simply was no longer an object, and it changed everything in many ways. Um, those of you who are anywhere close to as old as I am, which I'm always surprised to discover is old, um, know that your life takes so many twists and turns that you don't expect, and that you end up you know, sort of incorporating that into your lives uh, in whatever way you have to. I don't have to say that to a large group of people who have left their homeland and come to another land where they're using every day a language they didn't grow up with. Um, being in Taiwan at least allowed me to appreciate that in a way that I think most Americans don't. How hard it is to use a language on a daily basis that you didn't grow up with and don't feel as much like yourself in as you do when you're speaking the native language. And for that I appreciate the fact that so many of you do that every day. And are doing that right now as you listen to me talk. Uh, I want to say a couple of things. Um, Milo has written the book, um, and that's the place to go for the information. Uh, as I think most of you know now, Milo and I have not been together for many, many years. We, we separated in 1976, um, and we're both remarried. Our lives took very different directions. At the same time, we had a number of years together that were very, very good years. And the time we spent in Taiwan and the work we did there was probably the, the most valuable, wonderful part of our lives. And also especially because they produced three wonderful children whom you saw both as adults and, and somewhat as children. And my daughter Katie and her husband here, Paul, tonight are just so happy. <laughs> Katie's Chinese name is Tang Mei Sheng. <laughs> because three months after we were arrested and deported, she was born in the United States. <laughs> but she started in Taiwan. <laughs> 
divide up what we were going to do. And um, I, I agree that I would talk about sort of why did we do what we did, because it was not the typical thing that missionaries did there. And I think part of what is important to understand is that we didn't expect to go to Taiwan. He talks about that in the book. Uh, we thought we were going to go to Hong Kong, because we were really interested in China and in Chinese society and uh, thought that was as close as one could get back then when Americans could not go into China freely at all. Um, and yet the church said we were going to go to Taiwan. And then what we discovered, of course, is that as Methodists, um, we, uh, we represented Methodist missionaries, many of whom we met there, older missionaries who had been on the mainland and were very much identified with the nationalist government, with the KOT. Um, even uh, Madame John herself was a Methodist, and um, and uh, John Kaishek was, of course, at one point, I think when it was expedient for American support, <laughs> baptized as a missionary. Um, and uh, that meant that as we arrived as Methodist missionaries, we were expected to identify with what many people saw as a government that was oppressing a lot of people. And we were expected to study, to study Mandarin and to go to Wei Tang, uh, some of you may know in Taipei, the Methodist church that was there. Um, and we didn't know a lot before we came about conditions in Taiwan. I mean, we had a plan to go there. We knew about it having been a Japanese colony. We knew that after World War II, it was seated back, or it was at least let go by the Japanese. Um, we knew that the government, uh, the nationalist government, had retreated there in 1949, and that the Americans had come in to support it. <laughs> we knew the terms Free China. Um, and that was sort of it. Um, but shortly before we came to Taiwan, um, we met a man who had spent some time in Taiwan um, and had been actually a missionary there. And uh, he said to us, um, his name was George Todd. I don't know whether anybody ever met him. Still alive in his late 80s in New York City. Um, he said, if you're going to go to Taiwan, listen and learn. He said, find a way, even before you know how to read Chinese, find a way to find out what the local Chinese newspapers are saying, the Taiwanese papers. He said, get to know, don't just make assumptions. Um, and the other thing that he did was he told us to look up a man named Don Wilson, who was then a Presbyterian missionary there. And that, those words meant something. So that very shortly after we got to Taiwan, we heard about things like 228. We began to hear about the fact that there was martial law in free China. Um, and that people did disappear into political prisons. And that you didn't talk freely um, if you didn't want to get in trouble. These were things that sometimes were whispered to us, sort of not talked about in very loud terms. Um, but they disturbed us a lot. Uh, and it disturbed us that we as Americans um, would be seen as representing support for that kind of thing because if we didn't do anything, then it looked like we did. It was pretty significant to me that one of the first things that happened after we got to Taiwan, you know, coming in after that long flight across the Pacific and tired, and again, I traveled both directions pregnant. Somebody said it was the longest pregnancy anybody ever had. Uh, my our oldest daughter was born three months after we got there, and my mother never forgave me for taking her first grandchild across the country before she'd ever seen it, across the, I mean, around the world. 
Uh, I just said it was a good way to get her to come visit. <laughs> but she did. Uh, but, oh sorry, where was I? What was I saying? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, let me go to this. Uh, we, we, um, we heard these things and we were disturbed by them. But it wasn't really until Don Wilson, within a, about three to six months, I think, after we got there, um, we had made sure to get to know Don and to tell him we were interested in knowing things. And Don called us one day and said, I want to introduce you to someone. He's a friend that I've been keeping in touch with. Um, and um, I'm going out of the country. He didn't tell us this right away. We only heard this later. He was getting ready to go back to the States. And he was pretty sure, because of things he had been doing, that he was not going to get a visa to come back into Taiwan. And of course, the man he wanted to introduce us to was Peng Ming Min, Dr. Peng. And I'm going to call him Peter when we talk about him, uh, which may sound disrespectful, but I, it's partly to help you understand what a very close friendship we developed with this man. And for me to continue to refer to him as Dr. Peng somehow doesn't fit how I think of him. Um, in the first place, it was unusual because we were invited to his house to have dinner. So that Milo and Don Wilson and I went um, and, um, and met his wife, uh, who was there as well. And we had a very you know, sort of small, intimate dinner together. And as Milo relays in his book, we began to discover what it meant to be sort of on the wrong side of the government when we left uh, his house that night because we got into the taxi and as the taxi took off we thought we were going to go home. Suddenly behind us there was a jeep, a truck, something with very bright headlights pouring into the back of the taxi that was following us as we went along. It was naive us, 20-somethings, it was pretty scary. Um, and um, uh, some of you may remember, we, went, we, uh, we knew we shouldn't go straight home. So we had the taxi driver go uh, towards Ximending. Uh, it <laughs> seemed like even in the evening it would be busy enough that we could probably get lost. And um, for those of you who are old enough to remember, there was a very interesting coffee house in the area called Yeren. Um, <laughs> And um, this was at a period, I think, when um, Liao was still being a young rebel, and uh, uh, there were sort of a little sort of beatnik feel to that place. And we walked around and ended up going into the coffee shop and drinking coffee, and sat where we could look out the window and sort of thought the jeep had gone away. And when it felt safe enough, we managed to get find our way back home. And I think probably at that time, they didn't identify who we were. But it gave us a sense of the kind of life that Dr. Pung, Peter, was living. Because he was under house arrest, which essentially meant that he could leave the house, but he was followed everywhere he went. And people that he met were then visited later and harassed. Um, which really meant, in fact, that although he was still living in Taida housing, very nice house, still getting his salary, uh, you know, his rice bowl was not broken. Uh, at the same time, he was not allowed to teach. He was not allowed to interact with his students or with his colleagues. Um, and he didn't try to because he knew that it would create problems for him. Uh, so he was quite isolated. And I think because of that, and because we were so interested in knowing more about Taiwan, and it was so intriguing to us, um, that we became friends in a way that would never have happened if the situation had been different. Here is this highly cultured, uh, very, had been very successful man at the top of his profession before he took that risk to speak out. Um, had had, you know, seminars in the United States at Harvard. He was known internationally. 
And he was coming to the house of two 20-somethings from Texas, of all places, uh, and hanging out with us. And we used to have these wonderful conversations way into the night, talking about Taiwan, but also talking about all kinds of other things. Um, and he kept us up because he kept up on what was going on. He had lots of ways of sort of knowing things that were happening, but they were always done sort of under, under the radar. Uh, and of course, and Milo is going to talk about this uh, after I, eventually when his graduate students, um, Shea and Wei, came out of prison, we met them too. And our activism, our actually finding a direction to do what we thought we needed to do, was very much channeled through those three relationships. Uh, and I think what Peter did was to personify for us the oppression that many, many people experienced. And he wasn't oppressed economically. You know, some of you know at least that he came from an old family in Taiwan, from Kaohsiung, um, that had means. So it wasn't like he was suffering without enough to eat, but his soul was suffering, his mind was suffering. And we just, I think, uh, it, it's a kind of relationship that maybe doesn't happen under ordinary circumstances. But for me, that relationship was extremely important and is sort of the reason why ultimately we were willing to take the risk to do some things that we knew could potentially have consequences for us too. At the same time, I want to be sure you're clear, because certainly Milo and I were clear, that um, the worst thing that was likely to happen to us, because we were Americans, was that we would be arrested and deported, which is exactly what happened. Uh, we knew that the risk for Taiwanese who were at, involved in the kinds of things we were doing were much greater, and that, of course, also proved to be true, uh, both with Mr. Shea and Mr. Wei. Um, I've been taxed with just giving you a little hint of how we came up with the idea of getting Peter out of the country. Um, and why? What began to happen uh, over the couple of years that we knew Peter, from 1966 to 1968, was the pressure got heavier and heavier. He was regularly called in, invited to come and have dinner uh, with various people in the secret police organizations. You know, they would take, uh, take him to a restaurant or take him into their headquarters. They would sit down and have a friendly meal and they would give him friendly advice. Um, and that advice gradually got more and more frightening so that they began to talk to him about um, it would be very easy if you were walking down the street for a car to go out of control and run you over. Uh, and uh, just, you know, you need to be careful, Dr. Pong, etc. And he began to take these threats very seriously. We knew nothing about how to get somebody out of the country. I mean, see, really, we were total naive. And we, when we decided that it was time to get him out, that it, and he was willing to go, and remember, for him to leave meant to leave his wife, to leave his children, to leave his mother uh, uh, and all of his relatives, his uh, siblings, etc. But he just said, "I have to do it. I, you know, I'm going, if I stay, I'm going to die. If I leave, I can at least do something abroad." Um, and so we. We talked endlessly about this. You know, sort of the standard thing was to think maybe a fishing boat. You know, maybe we can bribe somebody if we can get the right money. But the problem with that, which was similar to the problem that actually got him caught with the printing press when they were trying to distribute leaflets, the problem was that anytime you involve people you don't know, like a fishing boat person, 
there's always the danger, even if they're taking money, that they will also betray you. And we knew that the consequences would be terrible. And I don't know, those of you who may still remember what it was like under the white terror. I mean, there were, sometimes there were things that were funny, as well as serious. The government paid a great deal of attention to censoring magazines like Time and Newsweek that came in. So that we would, you know, we subscribe to those magazines, and we would get the magazine, and there would be a page missing. Uh, or just a half of a page had been cut out. You could just picture some little government censor going in and cutting, you know, every single magazine that had come in. And that was one time when it was useful to know people who might have been with the embassy because their mail didn't go through the Taiwanese mail system. So we, could, we would usually uh, get in touch with a friend and say, what was on page such and such? We don't know what they thought was worth cutting out. But the interesting thing is that apparently this particular article missed the censor. And it was an article about a couple of people in East Germany, young people. Remember, back during this time the Cold War was going on, the Berlin Wall was still up, and up high, and there were people trying to escape from Germany. And it was an article about these two East German young people who had managed to arrange to have some other European tourists come into East Germany and to lose their passports, to, to pretend that they had lost their passports, but to hand them over. They handed them over to this East German couple. They had pictures that they had managed to prepare uh, that would match the passport pictures so that they removed the one passport picture and put in the other one. Um, and this couple of, of kids, they were like young people, had gotten out of East Germany and they were it's just a little article in Time magazine. But Mama and I saw that article and we said, that's it. <laughs> There's a way we can actually do this. If we, you know, we can just... <laughs> and it, it, it seemed terribly audacious, but you know, there's, this is one place where Taiwan's history came in very handy. Because, of course, Dr. Hung, Peter, spoke excellent, native-sounding Japanese. He'd gone through the Japanese schools all the way up into college, as you know. He lost his arm in Nagasaki, courtesy of an American military plane, <laughs> strafing a civilian ferry boat. You know, oh, these things are so twisted, aren't they? Uh, and uh, so he had excellent Japanese. Uh, we thought he could probably disguise himself well enough to look like a Japanese tourist, and so that was the idea. And um, from that point on, and I won't go into detail because, again, Milo does it beautifully in the book, um, with the help of Taiwanese and Japanese friends in Japan, with the help of people in Hong Kong and people in the United States, part of whom were people we had recruited when we set up our courier service just to help bring in letters that didn't have to go through the Taiwan post office. With the help of all those people, we actually managed to have a Japanese tourist visit uh, and for Peter to go out on a Japanese Airlines airplane out of Sunshine Airport in Taipei, the old airport, of course, uh, and uh, to do it you know, with a beard, if you saw the picture, he drew that beard very carefully. I took the passport photo with my own little Pentax thing and a uh, camera. And, um, and we, of course, one of the things we worried about was how to disguise his arm. Because anyone who knew much about, you know, politics or, or about theater, and that was a lot of secret police types, knew that he was missing an arm and that that might be a dead giveaway. And, that's, and so we came up with the idea that we would create a backstory in which he had scalded his arm with something if he were asked. And so he, uh, we carefully wrapped him in gauze and he went out with his arm in a sling. Uh, and was ready to explain to them if they asked. But they didn't. <laughs> so it wasn't ever an issue. He simply went out with no challenge, no problem uh, as a Japanese tourist. And he flew not to Japan, but to Hong Kong, 
which was the first stop on his journey to Sweden. And I have to say thank you to Amnesty International. I hope you all support that organization. It was hugely helpful to Peter, uh, to Wei, to Xie, and to all of the other people that we ever met who were political prisoners who said it meant so much to them to get letters, even if they were letters from people that they you know, had never heard of. It was the people that wrote to Peter when he was in prison that were the ones that arranged for him to be granted uh, you know, asylum in Sweden. Did it just out of the goodness of their hearts, ordinary people, uh, that he was able to end up that way. So um, I know you have questions and we'll get to those with the question and answer thing, but I very much appreciate your willingness to listen to all of this and uh, I look forward to being uh, able to answer some questions later. Thank you. Next one, I will introduce you to Dr. Myra Fomeri. and for all of the political work, I heard the summary uh, of this tonight, the political work that is being done by FAPA, I say, it's in the line. <laughs> I have a friend, Laura Custer, she's 95, and for three years, uh, on Thursday afternoons, I go over to her house and I read to her. And at her insistence, a uh, year and a half ago, she insisted that I read Fireproof Moth to her. And I did. And every day when I went, she, we would read a little bit. And there was one question that she asked over and over again. She said, when you learned what kind of situation you were in, why didn't you take your family and leave? <laughs> there was in that some judgment. 
uh, like somehow maybe I was a negligent parent and not a very good husband. Uh, the, now in some ways, the book is an answer to that question. But the one line answer to that question is that when you have made friends and you learn beyond the shadow of a doubt that their lives are in danger, it is much easier to try to do something to help them than it is to walk away. There was another thing, and I, I talked with Aura about this a lot too. I said that I was also married to a woman who had no fear, and who had no fear for us, for the children. She had this sense that we needed to do what was right. And for that Now you have heard her say about how our relationship with Dr. Kahn developed and how when we learned that he was going to be assassinated, and we did. I remember that night when for the first time he was convinced and we were convinced that it was not just a threat but that it was going to happen. And then when he left that night, we said, how can we convince him that he's got to go? Otherwise, he's going to be dead. Well, there were two other close friends that we had. Wei Jing Chao and Xie Zong. Now, these two former graduate students of Dr. Pung, who were, of course, arrested with him in the uh, in 1964 when they produced the Manifesto for Foremost and Self-Salvation. Uh, now, we didn't meet them, of course, right away because they were still in prison. But they were, from the beginning of our relationship with Dr. Pung, right in the heart of that relationship, not the least reason of which they were sending messages out all the time, and that's how that information for Amnesty International got out of the prison from Wei and Shep. Came on very tiny, thin sheets of paper that I never would have believed existed. And I guess I probably just as well not know how they got them out of prison. But they did. And those sheets went to Amnesty International. And they had on there the name of the prisoner, the charge and sometimes it had clues about where their family was. And when we began to look, we learned what desperate circumstances these families were in. Harassed from every side. We said, isn't there something that we can do to help these families? Well, Dr. Pan thought so, and Xie and Wei thought so. Now, we didn't meet them for two years, but Wei was released from prison on the 1st of September the 20th, 1968. He hadn't been out of prison a week when he came to our house. Well, the stories about Wei Ting Tao some of you know these stories. They know that he was never intimidated by the authorities and that at his secret trial in 1964, he stood up and demanded that the judge sentence him to death. He used to leave his followers when he was out of prison on these jogs up into the mountains. Uh, fearless. Before I knew him, 
I wondered what kind of a man that he was. I had heard these stories, and that day when he came in, he greeted Judith and me, and then he saw our two-and-a-half-year-old daughter Elizabeth hiding behind a chair. And before we knew it, Way was sitting on the floor with Elizabeth, talking to her in Mandarin and Taiwanese, and maybe Hakka too, I wouldn't have known, but uh, he had transformed Elizabeth and she was talking back and forth to him. Within a week, he was helping me with my history lectures, and God knows I needed it. The, the, uh, but he, he was an incredible man. She had got out of prison exactly a year later in 1969, and, and like way, he came to our house within a week after he was out of prison. Now, what Judith didn't say specifically is that all of these visits for four years that, that Peter made to our house, they were secret and there's no indication that the government ever knew about them. Same for Way and Shea. When Shea came, we had already been talking to to Matthew, that is the name that we gave to Wade. We had been talking with him about a project to aid the families of political prisoners, and he said that he was ready. And the first time that, that Shed walked into our house, he said that he was ready to begin distribution. Excuse me, he's just out of prison. He's just out of prison and he's ready to take on this job for which he could be killed. It's a capital crime. I mean, we were smuggling money in that the American Friends Service Committee in Philadelphia was raising secretly for the families of political prisoners. But for, for him or for, for Matthew or Tony, she had, I mean, yes, yeah, yeah. uh, it was a capital offense. They were ready. And we asked about it. And they said to us, they laughed, they shrugged it off. I don't know that they knew what fear was. But more realistically, they said, we are the only two people who have the credibility and who know how to find these people and that they will have courage enough to take the money from us. They were the only two people that could do this. And they did. Time after time after time. All over the island, wherever they could find, wherever they could find the families, which was not an easy thing to do. Well, a year later, in Feb on February the 23rd, 1971, a week before Judith and I were arrested, Matthew and Tony were arrested. As Judith said, we were right about being fireproof moths ourselves. They were not. And we knew what would happen. We had known it from the start. In fact, when we started out with, with, with Peter, we knew the liability of being associated with greenhorns like us who, who knew nothing about this. And we knew that we only risked deportation, or at least that's what we thought. And we knew that the Taiwanese that would be associated with us risk far, far more, and as again Judah said, it was true. Tony and Matthew this time were tortured horribly. We know this in some detail because she was able to get a letter out of prison, again, a letter out of prison that found us in 1972 in New York, that we were able to get published as an op-ed in the New York Times. 
they suffered terribly. Judith and I suffered nothing like they had. After their release a second time, Shea went into exile and lived here in Southern California for a while. And I was talking to some people who knew he lived here in Orange County. His house was also bombed uh, while he was here, probably by the KMT. Um, these, even after they were out of prison and back to Taiwan in the beginning days of the democratization, they continued to serve. Both of these men in their own documents produced significant documents, documentation of white terror, of who suffered, how long, where, and she was a tireless advocate for reparations for former political prisoners. Wei himself published the Taiwan Human Rights Report, 1949 to 1996. Now, Wei, of course, was arrested yet a third time. He was involved in, 19, in the December the 10th Gaoshom incident. I think it's December the 13th, right? Somebody. The, the, he was involved in that, and for the third time, he was arrested and went to prison. When he came out at the end of martial law, he lived for a few years in 1999, though on his Sunday morning jog at public school, Wei Ting Chao's great heart stopped beating. He didn't die in prison, but there is no doubt in my mind that he died because of the years he spent on behalf of the Taiwanese people in prison and his labors on all our behalfs. Peng Ming Min, Xie Tong Ming, Wei Ting Chao. Although not ostensibly religious, now Judith reminded me, of course, that Peter comes from an old Christian family. But I want to tell you, in the time that we knew him, he really didn't have much patience with that part of his heritage. And he didn't consider himself religious. And now, of course, uh, Shih Tzu Ming is in fact a Christian, but he was not then. These three men, not ostensibly Christian at the time that we knew them, demonstrated to me with their lives the justice and mercy that I had associated with the highest Christian values. They were examples of the core Christian teaching of the Good Samaritan that I had learned as a child. They were examples. On March the 27th, 1964, before, when we were in Boston preparing to go to Taiwan, I picked up the Boston Globe one morning and I read about the story of the murder of Kitty Genovese in Queens, New York, two weeks earlier. Now, why her murder in New York would show up or be news in a Boston newspaper is a question, but the question is that this was no ordinary murder. This woman had been stabbed repeatedly for 30 minutes just outside her house in Queens. Her neighbors heard, they knew that it was her, and not one person called the authorities. Not until after the killer drove away for 10 minutes and then came back to finish the job did someone have the courage to call 911? You know that this was a story of shame, national shame. Later, of course, the bystander effect, 
The Genovese Syndrome is what it was called. It's what happens when a group of people around see a crisis and they don't do anything. Now, we were new to the urban northeast and it was easy, easy for me to blame the neighbors of Kitty in Queens. But there was something down inside my conscience that wondered if they could be me. I was haunted by the picture of Kitty Genovese as I went to Taiwan. I wondered if I was the they by leaving the United States during the civil rights movement, during the beginnings of the anti-war movement. And yet I didn't change my course. I went on to, to Taiwan. But in Taiwan, what I found soon enough was how a brutal, corrupt government was dependent on the support of the United States of America for its very survival. I could not imagine how it was that so many missionaries, American students, U.S. military, embassy personnel, who heard the cries of the Taiwanese people and yet chose to do nothing in ways that were not at all dissimilar from the neighbors of Kitty Genovese. Judith and I were told repeatedly, you are guests in the country, mostly from other missionaries, as the reason for not getting involved in political affairs in a country that's not your own. And the principle has some merit in international relations, but it is also a principle that can be an immoral rationalization. In Taiwan, this brutal government was unable to stay in power because of what my government was doing. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my country. I love the church and what the church sent me to Taiwan to do. But my conscience didn't allow the luxury of being politically uninvolved. By doing nothing, Judith and I believed, I think I speak for both of us, Judith and I believed that we were putting our stamp of approval on what our government was doing in Taiwan. And as an act of faith, we chose to do other. I doubt that Pan, Wei, or Xie ever heard of Kitty Genovese. But they would have understood the tragedy of the neighbors' reactions. They would also have understood what happened in Utah a couple of weeks ago that you will have remembered this story. When, when there was a car accident and the car burst into flames, it was on a motorcycle and the motorcycle burst into flames and there was a man underneath the car and there was a woman who ran over she knelt down and she looked and she saw that the man underneath was alive and she called out for help and the people who were backing away because of the explosion that was sure to come they came forward and eight people two women six men they reached down the car was hot they reached down and they lifted it up and somebody pulled the man out and his life was saved. Peter, Matthew, and Tony would have understood exactly that. Because they have given their lives taking personal risks on behalf of the people of Taiwan. Their legacy 
will live on and continue to bear fruit because I believe that such conscience and courage is never lost. Never. Such a legacy has never been more in need in Taiwan, in the United States, and in the world today than it was. We are not finished yet. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Tu Su Yao give us a